On today's program, a conversation with the mother of narrative medicine, Dr. Rita Sharon. I came to medicine because I was a lifelong reader. A generation ago, Sharon and her colleagues at Columbia promoted a concept of clinical care that paid close attention to the stories their patients told them. What I did in the office, what patients paid me to do, was to pay exquisite attention to the narratives that they gave me, which were in words, in silences, in their body, in how the body changed, uh, in what other people said about them. And that it was my task to cohere these stories so that they at least provisionally made some sense. Rita Sharon and her former student, Dr. Kathy Kirkland, in conversation today on the Hear Me Now podcast that comes to you from the Providence Institute for Human Caring. I'm Sean Collins, so glad you're with us. It's been 20 years since the editors at the Journal of the American Medical Association accepted an essay from Dr. Rita Sharon. In it, she coined the phrase narrative medicine to describe what she and others at Columbia were doing. They were paying attention to what their patients said, really paying attention. This is from that issue of JAMA. The effective practice of medicine requires narrative competence. That is the ability to acknowledge, absorb, interpret, and act on the stories and plights of others. Medicine practiced with narrative competence, called narrative medicine, is proposed as a model for humane and effective medical practice. Adopting methods such as close reading of literature and reflective writings allows narrative medicine to examine and illuminate four of medicine's central narrative situations. Physician and patient, physician and self, physician and colleagues, and physicians and society. With narrative competence, physicians can reach and join their patients in illness, recognize their own personal journeys through medicine, acknowledge kinship with and duties toward other healthcare professionals, and inaugurate consequential discourse with the public about healthcare. By bridging the divides that separate physicians from patients, themselves, colleagues, and society, narrative medicine offers fresh opportunities for respectful, empathetic, and nourishing medical care. Dr. Rita Sharon has spent the subsequent years since that was published caring for patients in New York and teaching physicians this close reading of their patients' stories. In a sort of hermeneutics of healthcare, they've trained a group of doctors who have spread out across the country promoting this style of practice. One of them is Dr. Kathy Kirkland, Director of Palliative Medicine at the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center and Chair in Palliative Medicine at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. Dr. Sharon and Dr. Kirkland, I'm so glad you're able to be here today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me, Dr. Sharon, where the notion of narrative medicine came from. So I was already a doctor. I was, I don't know, an assistant professor of medicine at Columbia, had my own patients in the clinic, and I was bedeviled by the contradictory stories that I was hearing from a patient and her mother, from the intern in the, in the emergency room, the nurse up on the ward. And I'm saying, how do I know who to listen to? I mean, I really took very seriously my primary care doctor role, somehow making sense of the cacophony of contradicting um, or at least abutting accounts of, of illness. And almost as a luxury, I said to my mentor, I'm going to go to the English department and take a course. Like that was like a breakthrough thought. And God bless David Rothman. He says, Rita, 
don't take a course, take a master's. And I did. Hmm. And uh, Kathy will understand this sense. I'm sitting in a seminar, you know, on Hart Crane or Melville, and I'm saying, oh, my God, this is how it works. This is how a story is constructed. And right from the beginning, what I was learning in my seminars on narrative theory had immediate impact on what I did in the office. Isn't that wonderful that you were able to make that application right away? Yeah. Yeah. And most of it was, don't talk so much, Rita. Just put your hands in your lap. Don't type. Just listen. (laughs) Kathy, you know this. Isn't this what we do? Yeah. I mean, I think that is, listening is the part of communication that medicine forgot to teach. Mm -hmm. And the way you learn it is through learning how to be a reader. And I think that's what I learned from Rita. And that's Mm -hmm. what I try to put into practice in the work that I do now. Dr. Kirkland, tell us about that work that you do now. What, what is it that you're, how are you applying this? to your practice? Um, It's a great question. There's so many levels on which I apply what we have learned, which is, you know, pretty simple when it comes down to it. But so there's the the level of just being a doctor to patients who are facing serious illness, advanced serious illness, nearing the end of life sometimes, Um, listening to them sometimes in an accelerated way trying to create meaning out of the story of their lives and being able to receive that and help them co-construct that at a time when it's really important. Mm -hmm. Then there's the um, listening to all the stories that surround that person's story, the family, the care partners, the doctors and nurses who care for them, Um, trying to listen for how their stories either align or don't align with that and trying to find the meaning there and creating space for all those different perspectives. And then finally, I think in the teaching of younger junior colleagues how to become effective palliative care physicians, I, I go back to the classroom um, and I use some of the techniques that I've learned from Rita to teach them how to read mm-hmm. and to um, write as a way of recognizing, oh, this is, this is the same thing that we do when we're with patients. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, and then when I go home, I use it with my partner. I use it with my kids. I mean, it becomes a way of life. Narrative medicine is almost too narrow a term now. It's narrative life, narrative practice, Mm -hmm. narrative living. Yes. And the world could use a lot more of it, right, Rita? Yeah. I hear so many echoes with journalism. Yeah. Say more. You know, I, I spent 25 years in a newsroom and working in radio. So the idea of listening to what people were yeah. saying was absolutely crucial. And I had a colleague, uh, I remember so clearly learning from him the importance of not following up immediately, mm-hmm. but to pause and to mm-hmm. let the pause apply some pressure to the speaker. Yes. Because there is a pressure to fill the to fill the silence, to fill the gap. And and so often we want to do exactly what I'm doing now, which is say more in the questioning. But if you shut up and listen Mm -hmm. uh, and let that pause sort of work its way into the psyche of the person telling the story, something amazing often comes out next. Yes. I'm often um, trying to teach clinicians how to interview as if they were not a doctor. You know, it's really trying to teach them to be a qualitative researcher or an anthropologist Hmm. and not go in, does it hurt more when you walk up the stairs? Does it go into your left arm? But to really play dumb 
and say, what is it I can possibly learn? And, and to follow what another person says. I mean, there's very specific things. We have potential interviewers, like qualitative interviewers. You know, what you're really doing is listening for the words that people use and, and just follow, follow the words they use. And, and don't override what they're trying to tell you with a, a question that's on your list your schedule. Uh, the medical students have a hard time doing that because we've been training them to do something else. Um, so part of it, and they get, they, 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 they're very uneasy um, leaving behind their list of questions. But once they realize the benefit and what they, the depth that they are able to achieve with patients, they say, oh, and it's like it's it's mm. for them a real uh, turning. It's a turning. Does that resonate with you, Dr. Kirkland? Yes, of course. Um, that the silence is so powerful. And I think about it. I was listening to Rita talk about you know going into an encounter with curiosity to find out what the story is. It is so much like reading a book. I mean, we get into bed with a good novel. We don't say, okay, I need to know what happens now, and I only have 15 minutes. We don't interrogate the novel, but at the same time, we, are, um, we aren't in that silence. We're not just passively listening. We're working with what we're hearing. We're imagining, we're creating hypotheses, and we're testing them against what we hear next. And so it's a very active... Mm -hmm. listening that I think is very much like reading um, mm -hmm. that has to be true to the text you can't just go off on this journey of your own that takes a patient the first thing a patient tells you and you know you're 10 miles down the right. street thinking that you figured it all out when in fact it needs to be tested against that patient's yeah. unfolding story and so that mm -hmm. idea of slowing people down and saying you know, yes, you have a hypothesis, but remember, it's a hypothesis, and it has to be tested against the rest of the story. There are a million things I wanted to, us to talk about, <laughs> and this time today isn't going to be enough, and I'm, I'm already mourning the fact that we're not going to get to all the depth of what you all are uncovering. Um, so I, I almost feel like I have to apologize to the audience that we're not going to get to it all. Oh. Um, I do want to talk about this turn of phrase that has crept into so many parts of my life, and I assume it's very much part of yours. The, the phrase is making meaning, mm -hmm. and I see that it's at the root of narrative, and it's at the root of a lot of spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, it's at the root of a lot of how we deal with loss, mm. whether it's loss of function or loss of life or loss of relationships. And I, I'm so curious to hear how you, in your practices, see people doing that work. How do people take raw stimulus from their mm. life and, and make sense of it? Mm. Somehow I think the verb is not exactly right. Mm. That it might not be actually making the meaning, but maybe sensing the meaning or discovering the meaning or uh, 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 being open to it. Uh, William James says in, in, um, in his variety that um, there is an unseen order that we search for the unseen order. Uh, and he's not talking religious. I mean, he's not talking deistically. Uh, but I think whether we're reading a novel, whether we're writing a novel, whether we're writing an email to a friend, it is in the process of listening to the words come out of your mouth that you come to understand, oh, that's what this 
So uh, maybe it's almost that we we can be a little bit more, I'm going to say a funny thing, maybe we need to be a little bit more passive and kind of let the account unfold, let it unfurl uh, like a flower or something, and then see what's there to be seen. The listener is as much in charge of the meaning that comes out as the teller is, and that doesn't feel quite right to me. Yeah, I guess I would... It's a really interesting thing to think about. I think there's truth in both of your perspectives on this. Um, and, you know, first of all, there's a... I don't think there's one meaning to be discovered, um, right. and the meaning often changes over time. Exactly. Um, and I do, I like the idea of, and find it to be true, I know I learned everything I say, by the way, I just want to say I learned from Rita one way or another. <laughs> and I think it was this idea of the unthought known, discovering mm -hmm. what you know but you don't know you know through writing. I think that happens to us, and that I think is Christopher Bolas' work mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. It's a lot cheaper to write your way into your subconscious than it is to go to psychoanalysis, probably. But I think there is discovery to be had through the act of telling a story, and particularly in the act of writing your way into a story, yes. and then holding it up to the light to see, yes. you know, is this account feel true right now? Mm -hmm. And Yeah. Um, often it doesn't, you don't really discover that until two or three pages in, at least when I'm writing for this kind of work. But I also think there's a, there is a dynamic between the receiver of the story and the teller that um, maybe I think there's a little more activity than just being a passive recipient. Mm -hmm. that you're, through what I bring to a story a patient's telling me mm -hmm. and what I give back to them through my filter of I'm hearing you say this and I'm wondering is this is my are my conclusions right that there is kind of a co-construction going on and that there is a role for the reader as long as he or she is faithful to the text mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. can help discover the story, discover the meaning um, yeah. that can help even maybe create a meaning to be tested with with the person who's yeah. telling. But I don't know. I'm getting out into speculation here. But I think well, there some may be people in the, Some people in the field, the, the, the people who develop the, the, um, the narrative, the narrative um, uh, system, the listener as the container. Mm. And that there's a way in which you're listening it's a shape to catch, if you will, mm. that which the teller emits. I love that. And that there can be very rigid containers and there can be porous containers and or, 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 or aesthetically beautiful containers. So I, I, I think this whole field is exactly, as Kathy said, very much in search of even the images and, and the metaphors to be using um, to, to help others understand that this is not just frilly, this is not recess from biochemistry, like a lot of the medical students still think. Um, but that there's, but that there's power. There's power to be had, and it happens to be power for the good. It's a foundational science for yeah. clinicians, really. Yeah. That makes me think about um, this idea of the container. One of the things that I think is most important in the teaching of reading and writing to at least my fellows has to do with helping them to see that they're bringing a whole set of 
perspectives and assumptions and stories of their own to the encounter with the patient. And in my field in particular, right. we often will hear fellows say, you know, I have no idea why this person is choosing to get more chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. I would never do that. Yeah. Yeah. Or what this family just doesn't get it. You know, right. they aren't doing what I would do. Right. And it's like you, you know, we need to teach people how to be aware of their own perspectives and that they are perspectives so that they can set them aside so they can go in with that empty container to catch mm -hmm. the story of someone else and to be curious yeah. about that. And yeah. this is one way, powerful way to do that. Mm -hmm. One thing I'm aware of is that um, the container metaphor is, is apt, I think, because it, it gives the story a place to land yes. Uh, yes. rather yes. than just existing in the ether. It, it locates the story in time and in place and in person, and it allows the storyteller to hear the story being told. Yeah. And that then allows you to revise the story the next time you tell it. And 30 years ago, my mom died, and I began telling the story of her encounter with her oncologist and her decision to withdraw uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. And I started telling that story 30 years ago. I still tell that story. And it's been revised over the years, but it has become a set piece. It's almost like a comedian talking about you know their routine. It's like I tell that story the same way every time almost. It's been revised over the years, and it's been informed by how I've witnessed people receive it. Mm. To get back to the notion of making meaning, it, it helped me process my grief. Telling that story mm -hmm. gave me a way of making sense out huh. of that loss. And Sorry, I'm not able to stay on this call. As you can probably tell, we've run into a technical problem which we're going to fix by reconnecting with all of our guests and starting uh, the conversation back up again. As we do that, let me take a moment to remind you that you're listening to the Hear Me Now podcast that comes to you from the Providence Institute for Human Caring. And I'm Sean Collins, and our guests today are Dr. Rita Sharon, professor of medicine at Columbia University and executive director of the Columbia Narrative Medicine Program. And also with us from New Hampshire is Dr. Kathy Kirkland, professor of medicine at Dartmouth and distinguished chair in palliative medicine at the Geisel School of Medicine in New Hampshire. You know, the fact that they didn't call that school the Dr. Seuss School of Medicine, I think is just a marketing blunder. Um, but that's just my opinion. We're going to get back to the conversation as we recorded it. I asked my guests about that image of the speaker seeing the narrative land on an audience or on a listener and how important that is or whether it's important at all. It's critical. It's critical. Because why is it that I'm thinking of um, the injunctions that the man must not spill his semen? That it has to be, <laughs> that it has to be caught. That it's something precious, and it is not to be wasted. Hmm. Um, it's like that. Um, you know that uh, Judith Butler and Adriana Cavarero, the two philosopher uh, relational narratologists, um, keep reminding us that we cannot tell our own story. We cannot tell the story of our birth or our early infancy. And we rely on others to um, tell it to us. So that's another turn of the screw. That, that you, Sean, can tell your story to yourself as you write, as you, as you write and rewrite the story of your mother's illness and death. Um, and 
there may be parts that you have to tell to another and let that other tell it back to you. So that's the complexity. And maybe, Kathy, when you say we make meaning together uh, with a patient and a family, that that kind of collective expressing and hearing and then knitting together somehow what's been said. That's the creative part, maybe. I think also um, there's the stories that we should be bringing as medical professionals Ah. of the physiology, the science of disease that needs, that the patients need to complete their stories, Um, especially when the meaning making relates to decisions that people have to make about how to spend the time they have left. And so the, it becomes important that we can share the scientific, the evidence story in a way that it can combine with the patient's personal story of their values, their preferences, their experience of illness in order to write the next chapter together. And um, so learning how to tell stories as well as to hear stories becomes important when you're trying to do this in clinical settings where, you know, where it does matter. It matters everywhere, mm-hmm. but in particular, yeah. that, um, that type of co-creation, I think we haven't really talked mm-hmm. about. Mm-hmm. What, what do you do, or what's the advice for, um, say, a primary care doc who is time limited in encounters. Mm -hmm. How do you do any of this in 15 minutes or 20 minutes? I have a lot of experience in that because my my clinical work, unlike Kathy's, has been entirely as a primary care provider, uh, general internist, in a busy clinic. Um, And the easy answer to your question is, the better I get, and in my case, it is through reading and literary and understanding how are these stories constructed, what goes into them. The better I get at understanding that, the quicker I can do it. So indeed, things don't escape me very much. You know, A patient will say, say something to me, and then 10 minutes later I say to him, so you mean your body feels like a metal pipe? He says, how did you know? <laughs> And I say, you told me. So some of it is purely the facility of capturing every one of those drops and putting it to use. Uh, But there are other methods. I mean, my patients will write to me. Sometimes I even give them time. I turn the keyboard around on the computer and I say, here, you finish the note. And what the patient says when she finishes the note is something entirely I could never guess. Um, one patient, this is a brand new patient, and, and uh, she had lived in a lot of places, and she writes when she finishes my note, I feel like a hidden immigrant. She's an American, but she lived in Paris for a long time, and she lived in Tunisia. I feel like a hidden immigrant. Did that not give me something I could never have found on my own? So I think... I think uh, for persons like me and Kathy who are really able to use the method seriously, there's tremendous time that is saved in, 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 in getting what it is that patients tell us. Uh, but then there are the off times. Patients will write things and send them to me. Or, um, I don't know how you feel, Kathy, but the open notes has come. So patients are now able to read what I write about them or what I used to, I closed my practice a couple years ago. But patients can read now what their doctors write. And that's got a lot of pluses and minuses. And if we get to the point that it's not just open notes, but shared notes, that we really are able with the patient's words and voice in the chart to, to represent more faithfully what it is that's going on. That would be like a new life for medicine. 
It's certainly a new medical record and a lot more useful one. But. And uh, I worry a little bit that this open notes in the rush that it all happened might do the opposite. So we're going to see. Yeah. I agree with what Rita said about practice um, makes you more efficient at this. And I also, you know, often will answer that question with, you know, if you only have a certain amount of time, why not spend it with a yeah. quality level of communication? Mm -hmm. You know, there's no benefit to spending that 15 minutes talking at a patient. I find I have the luxury of having more time to spend with patients when I need it. But honestly, if in the first five minutes I say to a family member of an ICU patient, tell me what life was like before this catastrophe happened. I would say 90% of the time, I know what recommendation mm. I should make to them about the next course yep. of care after the, I've let them speak for mm -hmm. five minutes. You know, my grandfather's been sitting in a recliner saying that he wishes God would take him. And then he had this massive stroke, and we're trying to decide whether to put a feeding tube in. Well, it sounds like he was ready. He didn't want to prolong this stage of his life anymore. There's no way I'm going to find that out by asking a series of rote questions. It's just tell me what's important for me to know about this person. Another thing I learned from Rita. And they will tell you what's important for you to know, and you will know how to use that. And you know, the rest of the 45 minutes I may spend just helping them to process their anticipatory grief or helping them to feel good about the fact that they aren't making decisions. The patient is, the patient's body yes. is. So, um, you know, five minutes of listening is worth 30 minutes of talking. Hmm. What do you do when the narrative uncovers trauma? Uh, so the first thing to say is the gratitude or relief that a patient has found you worthy of hearing the trauma. Um, I think today is very different. Uh, asking that question today is different even from asking it two years ago. And I think we all have been impressed with the presence of trauma in, in our patients' lives, in our lives, in children's lives. You know, the ACEs, the adverse, uh, adverse conditions. And so I think we're at the very beginning of learning how to be, how to honor that situation. And we don't all have what it takes to tolerate hearing of others' trauma, especially if there's judgment. Uh, about why the trauma happened. Um, I'm, I'm on a research project listening to mothers who have had trauma in their childhoods now talking about their pregnancies and early parenting. And it is um, uh, tragic to see how their past never leaves them. It can't. And that we have to offer a presence, it's not enough to say a witness, a presence, a opening of a space to be able to say it without being further judged, and the shame and the guilt, it's profound. Sean, I don't know how you knew to ask that question, but we could be answering that question for another hour. And I think there's also the element of the the listener, the receiver of those stories needs a chance to process the listening um, mm -hmm. with a group of colleagues who um, can support mm -hmm. that process too. So there are multiple layers of the need to create safe 
spaces for those stories to come into the open, I guess. Yeah. The, the advent of discussion of trauma-informed care and narrative medicine, mm -hmm. I see as being a crucial humanization or rehumanization of medicine. Yes. Almost hearkening back to medicine's beginnings when, when maybe practically there was very little that could be done uh, other than listen mm -hmm. uh, and maybe offer some pain management. Yeah. But yeah. But I think one of the things we're learning is how we can choose to be less judgmental than we would otherwise be. Mm. I mean, I'm thinking back to my father, who was a GP in the French-Canadian neighborhoods in Providence, Rhode Island. He carried his French-Canadian Catholic beliefs and assumptions and judgments and biases into every home he went to. Now, most of the homes had the same <laughs> structure that he did, but not all. So there's a lot of work to be done on ourselves. And whether it's anti-racism training or whether it's trauma-informed care or whether it's narrative medicine at its best, it really involves a profound, dicey, self-examination, self-awareness. Um, what do I think when I hear about prison health, when I hear about uh, um, homeless drug addiction? When, what, what do, and to be brave enough to face up to our own pitiful uh, uh, prejudging and, and privilege, and I'm not just trying to speak the speak. I mean, this is now what we're teaching. Um, and I think we're, I think we have dividends of this horrible time that we've been through in the past couple of years that m m maybe we're learning more quickly than we otherwise would how, in fact, to take inventory of our own um, great big bank of judging. Providence had a, just about a month ago, had a conference, or the Institute for Human Caring did, titled Personalizing Care in a Transactional World. Mm. And one of the sessions was on humanizing the electronic health record. Mm -hmm. And the amount of time during that session that was spent on providing a prominent place for for patient elicited narrative mm -hmm. was impressive. Yeah. And it makes me think that there are the sort of gearhead tech types <laughs> who are looking at this and saying this is absolutely crucial to the way the electronic health record should should operate mm -hmm. in practice, mm -hmm. uh, which gave me a lot of hope that if it can be installed into the software, sort of hardwired into it, mm -hmm. then maybe there's all sorts of impetus to encourage providers to take a moment to read about their patient before they go into the room, yeah. re remind themselves who they're seeing, mm. what that person's story is. Um, we have to, though, remember the power hierarchy. Mm. And it is the case that I want my psychiatrist and my primary care doctor to know certain things about my past, but I don't particularly want my orthopedic surgeon to know that. Hmm. So how, how do we, can we tailor, can patients tailor what they want me to know as their internist, but not what they want the orthopod to know? Or how, how do we think that one through? I think those are great questions. You know, who's the curator of the record and what is its purpose? Um, the cynical among us would say it's for billing, but it, gets you, it can be used in harmful ways, as you're pointing out. And when a piece of false information is put in about a patient, it can have a life of its own. Yeah. I'm, I was asked to give a talk in January to address questions of stigmatizing language in the medical record. Yeah. Um, 
And so, you know, if we're really going to take this idea of co-producing or co-creating <laughs> care with patients and families, we, we are going to have to figure this out. Like, yeah. who, who, what are we creating and what record of it do we need and who has access to it and how do we use it for the purposes of good as defined by whom? So, so many questions. It's hard to imagine a medical record that's any worse than what we have now. Oh, I miss the old days where you could flip through looking for Rita's handwriting and go read those notes. Um, yeah. What What about the reluctant narrator ah. as patient or family member? Mm. Person who thinks I don't have anything to say. I don't. I don't have a story to tell. How do you How do you encourage the storytelling from such a person? You know, I don't think a story always has to be told. Um, so there may be a reason for silence. And so I guess I would encourage people to go into that situation with curiosity. Mm. Uncover the, the untold story, I guess. Um, Mm. This may not be very helpful, but I I would just be curious about about what the context is and why the silence. Respectful that the silence may be just part of the story or the mm. mm -hmm. the way it starts. It may be fear. It may be trauma. There's not always a, a, as much trust as there needs to be, and. Why should there be, uh, unless the trust has been built up over time? Uh, but your question reminds me how we in narrative medicine have been expanding the, uh, 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 the kinds of narratives that count. And it's not just words. And it's pictures, and it's music, and it's silence, and it's dance, and it's movement, and it's position, and all of those ways in which one person signals to another person that something happened. So, yeah. uh, and you know, when we, when we teach narrative medicine to medical students, they can choose among working in a poetry workshop or a studio, you know, let's hope we can bring our students back to the Met and MoMA and the Frick <laughs> soon <laughs> <laughs> to, to do the kind of gazing at real artwork that they need to do. Um, a, a colleague of mine just got a piece published in Academic Medicine on listening to Beethoven quartets and why that's helpful for, for his students. Because I was just thinking how I would not be able to bring Beethoven quartets to a group and do anything with them other than listen, you know, humbly. But I can take a poem to a group of students and I can walk them through a close read. So the idea that you need some kind of training to do this work, you can't just go in and throw a poem up on a whiteboard and say, isn't this cool? Um, so I would love to be in a room with a facilitator who could help me read Beethoven. I wanted to ask how important is it that the um, primary provider, the primary care giver, be the partner in the narrative process, or are there other people in the healthcare system who can also be brought in to encourage the the narrative's development? Absolutely. I mean. Nurses are hearing stories constantly as they tend to patients in and out of the room. Chaplains hear a different kind of story. I mean, one of the beautiful things about our work on the interdisciplinary palliative care team is hearing different versions of a patient's story from the team as different people have tapped into, you know, different parts of of someone's narrative. So a nurse, a social worker, a chaplain, 
someone from the arts or from healing arts, a massage person is listening while they give a massage. All of those are pieces of, sometimes the person cleaning the room is hearing, hearing a different story. So yeah. there's no shortage. Right. And, and also all our fancy subspecialists can do this work too. Uh, I think of David Ring, who used to be the head of the Mass General Hand Surgery Division. And he moved over to uh, Dell Medical School at UT Austin, in part because he realized he mostly took care of upper extremity um, pain symptoms, uh, problems. He, he, he realized over time that when people come in with elbow pain or shoulder pain, that chances are there's a fair amount of psychological distress behind this. And whether it is there from the beginning or it becomes there as an anxiety about why does my arm hurt. But he started to rely on the psychologists and the social workers and, and he developed into a completely different kind of orthopedist because he became tuned in to patients' feelings and affective states. And he discovered he was doing much less surgery and that his patients were getting better quicker if they had um, psychological care as well as his care. So I think, Kathy, anybody can do it. Whole persons caring for whole persons. There you go. Right? Right. Um, we're, we're coming to the end of our time together and I, I'm wondering Dr. Sharon, uh, what the experience is like for you to hear a student, a former student, living through so many of the things that you introduced her to? What's it like listening to Dr. Kirkland? Of course, I told you at the beginning that Kathy and I have been together for the long haul. So it's not, um, of course, it's, it's like um, mind-blowing to hear someone say, I remember what you said about starting a story. I mean, that's wild, Kathy. And I, I mean, I thank you for that kind of um, recognition. And it's a recognition that goes to this whole field. Uh, I mean, maybe I wrote the first book, but the second one was written with my whole team uh, when it got time to write the, the textbook of narrative medicine. I knew I couldn't do that by myself. And I needed the novelist, and I needed the philosopher, and I needed the uh, anthropologist. So, but what is extraordinarily gratifying is to see, and Kathy, this must happen to you too, uh, there are things going on all over the world that people are calling narrative medicine that's not kind of our brand exactly, but it is neighboring brands. It is a, it, it, it's become a very capacious word to stand for a kind of care that is radically listening, that is aware of the rewards of that kind of care for the caregiver. And that's, um, I'm going to use a word that one of you used at the beginning, that's humble in saying, I really don't understand this, and let me just put myself in the presence of those who can mm. tell it. So I think it's a great, great um, sign of health for our health care that there is as much interest in this work as there is. Dr. Kirkland, you've picked really good mentors. Um, it's, it's wonderful to hear you in conversation with Dr. Sharon. And it's wonderful to have the opportunity to do that. Every time I yeah. talk with Rita, I feel like I learn new things or amplify things that I've known before. So thanks for giving us the opportunity to spend an hour together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm grateful for the two of you taking the time. Um, and I, I just want to reiterate what I said at the beginning. Um, there's so much to talk about, and we've only scratched the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, is it asking too much to say, come back sometime and let's continue the conversation? Be happy to. It'll be wonderful. Thank you so much. Many thanks to Dr. Rita Sharon. 
professor of medicine at Columbia University and executive director of the Columbia Narrative Medicine Program. And thanks to Dr. Kathy Kirkland, director of palliative medicine at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center and chair in palliative medicine at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. The Hear Me Now podcast is a production of the Providence Institute for Human Caring on Twitter at human underscore caring. Do us a solid and follow us on Twitter for information on upcoming episodes and guests. And be sure to subscribe. You'll find us on Apple Podcast, Google Podcasts, Spotify, just about anywhere else you get your podcast. Just search for these four words, Hear Me Now Podcast. The program is produced by Scott Acord and Melody Fawcett. We have research help from medical librarians Amanda Schwartz, Seema Bakta, Sarah Viscuso, Catherine Gibbs, Carrie Grinstead, and Heather Martin. Our theme music was written by Roger Neal. The executive producer is Michael Drummond. We'll be back in two weeks with an episode devoted to the care of people with substance use disorders with some strategies for the holiday season and the ongoing pandemic. I'm Sean Collins. As always, thanks for listening. Be well.